you all for joining us for the second like the afternoon session of the ASU Tech Workshop focused on Rhino Compute. We are excited to show you how to connect a Jupyter Notebook and Python to Rhino Compute, uh, treating it as a backend API, and we'll get into more what that looks like in the workshop. So uh, to start us off, uh, we'll do some quick introductions from myself and Ping Shing. Uh, my name is Brandon Kachuka. I have a background in architecture and urban planning, and I worked for a number of years in, as a full stack developer. And now I work at KPF on the KPF UI team as an urban data analyst and web developer. I primarily focus on merging web technologies with architecture to create new interfaces or tools needed throughout the office. So this includes, we deployed Scout, which is a 3D web interface to interact with computational design and general design. I've done work on urban scale and analytics and other projects the UI has taken on. And um, yeah, my name is Ping Xiang Chen. Uh, just a really brief introduction about myself here. Um, I'm an architect and work as computational uh, specialist at Applied Research Team uh, in KBF. I've been working as computational uh, designer for the past 10 years. And also um, outside of um, company, I also teach at uh, Ballet School of Architecture in UCL. So my work in Applied Research Team are uh, generally split into projects, research, and development works. Uh, I will speak a little bit more about what we do in Applied Research Team in general uh, slightly later. So uh, this is about me for now. Sure. And I, I forgot one piece. I'm also, I think I mentioned it earlier with people following in. I'm finishing my master's right now in uh, urban data science at NYU, focusing on transportation, urban analytics, and AI. Uh, for my for my master's thesis. So yeah. before we get started, uh, as we talked about before, all of us uh, are sometimes used to, you know, previous years, we're all in the same room, introducing ourselves to one another. So we just wanted to open up the floor for anyone to introduce themselves. I know it's a little difficult now that we're all virtual, but hopefully that will end soon. So if you feel comfortable and you want to, feel free to unmute yourself and introduce. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable, no worries. We can talk on Slack. You can also introduce yourself on Slack, on the chat here just so we can all get to, get to know each other while we're in this workshop with one another. So if anyone wants to start. Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm Lucas, uh, structure, I'm a structural engineer uh, from Switzerland originally, working in Canada currently for StructureCraft as a software developer and computational engineer. And um, yeah, I've, I've uh, worked quite a bit with, uh, with data science during my master's degree at ETH in Zurich. And I'm really interested in uh, what, what you're doing with uh, Rhino Compute today. Great, welcome. Thanks. Hey there. Um, Sergey Pigac over here uh, from Core Studio. Um, background in architecture, now doing uh, full stack .NET development and also dabbling with AI. Very excited about this. Welcome. I'm Jeroen. I'm uh, part of Core Studio as well, uh, based in the London office, um, coming from an architectural background as well, but being in the sort of computational design within a structural engineering firm for the past, what is it now, eight, nine years, um, doing some coding, doing some geometry, all that sort of bits. Hi, Jeroen. Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to see you again. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Timon uh, Hazel. I come from Walter P. Moore in Washington, DC, and I'm a structural engineer and a Python developer. I'm excited to hear about this and see how we can integrate things. Wonderful, welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Patrick Wojnicka. I'm a computational design specialist at Intuitive, a structural engineering firm with background in architecture, and I'm super excited about the workshop. Awesome, architects, we're all here. And again, feel free to introduce yourself on chat um, if you feel comfortable. Hello there, uh, my name is Jan. I currently work for Tegelementum in uh, Berlin and Cologne, Germany. I'm an IT student and had a few run-ins with Rhino Compute and I'm quite curious to see what you guys are up to. Uh, learn some more. Uh, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Dong Yeop uh, Lee. Uh, I'm uh, an architect uh, working for uh, Smith Group in uh, Washington DC office. Um, I'm also uh, co-leading a competition uh, for our company and uh, I've been playing with the Rhino computer a little bit and I'm, I'm very, really curious how uh, KPF uh, is using the technology. Uh, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, good to, good to see you. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, I'm Joe. I'm uh, at uh, Dimensional Innovations in Kansas City, and I'm uh, a part of the R&D team, and I do parametric design and productivity uh, workflows. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome. Getting some more introductions on chat as well. Would anyone else like to introduce themselves? And if you don't feel comfortable, feel free to introduce yourself on chat, and we can always catch up on Slack as well. So we get some more introductions. Hi, um, my name is Wen Chen. So I work at KPF for the past few years. I I use like the user end from the Rhino compute, but now I would like to see the how the overall workflow is like. Yeah, nice to meet you all. Nice to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyone else would like to introduce themselves? Uh, we can go ahead and move on into the presentation. Yeah, sure. Interesting. Okay, right. Okay, so perfect. Um, thanks for the introduction from you know, from everyone, and it's great to see the mixture of people here. So, I guess before we start talking about the workshop content, um, I would like to just mention a few words about KPF in case um, some of you don't really know what KPF does. So KPF um, stands for uh, Com Peterson Fox is an architecture firm with nine branches across the world. So KPF is known for tall building design, but of course um, KPF also does all the other type of buildings and projects uh, in a wide range of scales. And within KPF, Brandon and I are part of um, a specialist uh, part of specialist teams. Um, uh, Brendan is from Urban Interface and me, myself, uh, from Applied Research. So uh, in KPF, we also have other uh, specialist uh, teams such as um, environmental performance, uh, digital practice, and more. So all these teams um, are on the so-called innovation framework in, in KPI, uh, KPF, and the aim is really to push innovation and support the entire firm and project. So um, Brendan, maybe you can speak a little bit about um, UI and, and what you normally do um, in UI. And I will speak about AR, yeah. Sure, so KPF UI primarily focuses on creating tools and workflows throughout the office at KPF. So we do like, you know, what we've commonly come to find within the architectural industry as an like optioneering, where we test thousands of options for performance analysis, whether that be for views, sustainability, for environmental protection. So we do these uh, on all our different design options. We show those to the design teams, and then we try to maximize value. And what we mean by that is not just trying to maximize value for the client, but also trying to unravel what it means for the larger context. Uh, so when we propose a new building, what does that mean for the surrounding context of the city? Because our buildings don't live in silos. Uh, so we do a lot of the evaluation, testing, computational design, and general design. Cool. And in applied research team, they are, um, the area we touch on is actually quite broad. So in general, we conduct in-house research and surface um, project specialized team to provide solution and enable um, project innovation within just KPF. Uh, so there are a few different aspects of research we do, um, ranging from design technology um, to manufacturing. So the most common things for people to understand um, what how we function um, on the solution side is that we are responsible of things such as geometry optimization, workflow automation and in-house software development for design exploration. So we are pretty much um, integrated in, in projects and then um, assist team to kind of push their design forward. Um, so next. So I hope that our self introduction give you guys a bit of um, context about where we come from. So I guess now I would like to just quickly frame the workshop a little bit and speak about some general issues we encounter during a typical architecture design process. So if you come from an architecture background, I believe that you shouldn't be too unfamiliar with a diagram like this, right? Uh, which looks really um, straightforward and linear um, during a sort of a defined development period. But if you look at this um, diagram uh, close enough, you probably will find yourself quite confused um, just simply because the process is always not that uh, straightforward and it's quite dynamic in many ways. And next page. And this normally gets um, much worse when you look at the entire ecology of building production cycle. Um, you will find this kind of a messy process not only happen 
during the design periods, but uh, in every stage, right? And what makes it even worse is that when something is required to be changed for any reason, the entire uh, building production chain is affected. Uh, next page. Therefore, how to create a neutral platform to allow different expertise to exchange information and being able to work together in much more collaborative and real-time manner become extremely important and also very critical to the complexity of the work we have today. Um, so in general, like in architecture firm, um, I mean, we talk, uh, we talk about having consultants on board earlier, uh, that, partially, uh, that, that partially helps reduce issues but allowing technologies to be on board early and lay one technology um, interact with another one. This is always a diffi difficult task. So next page. Um, although many architecture firms have been working on developing applications that can enable large design space to be explored. However, due to the amount of data and geometries needed to be processed, this process is, is still really static um, in, in many ways and it's very limited. Uh, next page. So if you look at the diagram here at the left side in particular, it shows the process that we normally go through, right? Uh, you can see from design analysis all the way to building details. However, this process is extremely um, uh, linear. If you still remember the previous diagram um, we show, um, this process is in reality is pretty much back and forth and tangled um, together. So one of the reasons that make it uh, so linear, this is simply due to the structure of the profession in AEC, uh, which links directly to how technology is generally uh, designed and developed, as well as, of course, uh, some limitation of um, computation uh, we have today. So the image at the right um, shows one simulation process uh, alone that require a few different um, external applications to work together. So if you have any experience uh, running a simulation, you will find that this process is always uh, very slow. Therefore, it's not easy to break through that linear process um, as what I was talking about. Also in this particular uh, workshop, we are not going to really talk about this review um, process, uh, but, uh, but uh, what we will be showing you uh, later will sort of kind of um, uh, link to, to this aspect of work next. And uh, speaking about that, I guess, um, yeah, Grace Albert has been a, an, um, an extremely amazing platform for, um, for designers today, I believe everyone agreed with it. Um, it allows much wider uh, disciplines to be um, able to engage with design process. But uh, still, there are a lot of um, technologies out there um, yet to be implemented. And also probably it's not a good idea to be implemented uh, in, inside the Rhino environment because um, each uh, software has, has its own limitation, right? So in this workshop, we would like to look at instead is the concept called um, code block. Um, but instead of looking at a code block as a, a function within an application, we will be looking at how to treat external application as independent uh, function to another application. So this will enable much wider accessibility to different applications uh, you would like to do. Um, so next page. And, and of course, this allows um, each application to do its own best, um, but at the same time, um, being able to collaborate uh, with other application and potentially you can use this, this approach to do this distributed um, computing uh, for a system process. And next page. And in addition to that, this opens up a wider possibility to have data flow between different application um, and, and become much more uh, end-to-end so that you can probably have this uh, loop system um, in place to allow things to kind of um, constantly uh, work with each other, which uh, has a potential to break that linear um, process I described earlier. Next page. So just in case um, some people here are not familiar with the concept of code block and why we focus on this today, I will just use a really simple sort of um, example to kind of demonstrate the idea. So as you can see here, um, uh, uh, each component is a function uh, that does its own job, right? For instance, um, we have um, whatever a point or a circle here, they are a function on its own. And when you sort of wire uh, a few of them together, that becomes a, a much more um, complex uh, function, right? And then if you 
package all these different uh, components together, um, it becomes basically a function that could be um, reused um, in many ways. And there are just a few ways um, to do do things like these uh, in free software uh, environment alone. So I'm not gonna, gonna talk about that now. Next page. So if we simplify building um, design a little bit and just look at a few stage of work uh, we normally uh, have, for instance, like missing analysis, facade or some um, material and as individual sort of a function. So it means that um, a final design of a building is made of all these, as, all these different parts, right? So if we change one piece of function, say um, just change one of them, and then the overall design outcome will be completely different. I guess this is not a, not very new, but uh, next page. But mostly we, we do things like this within a sort of a restricted environment, right? Which in this case is Grasshopper. Um, or if you work um, with a Dynamo or whatever, um, you are restricted there. So if you write code, um, you still have to rely on um, this piece of software, like for example, in Rhino, it's Rhino, Rhino Common Library or Grasshopper Library, right, API. So therefore, uh, what we would really like to bring to the table today is really about creating function that is outside Grasshopper and Rhino environment, and then treat that application as part of the core um, blocks within the entire process. Next page. So to do that, um, we will be introducing Rhino Compute Technology. I hope that um, so far, um, everything mentioned above um, will give you guys a bit of context about this workshop. And now I'm going to hang over to Brandon uh, for the introduction of Rhino Compute and our workflow. Sure, thank you, Ping Xing. So as we discussed, <clears throat> you know, we have this workflow within Rhino and Grasshopper where we have tools that we've built from different view analyses to uh, simulation for outdoor comfort, indoor comfort, thermal analysis. But all these tools are somewhat siloed within Grasshopper and Rhino. And so if you ever want to hand those off to, let's say, a, a data scientist on your team or to someone who's not necessarily interested in working within Rhino, but you want to give them access to that information, there's not really a clear way to do it until now we have Rhino Compute to get that data in inside out. So as you've seen, uh, within our field of architecture and within the industry field of technology, the field of spatial analytics and data science continues to grow where we're seeing more and more softwares come up as a result of more different analytics being brought to the table to unravel urban, the urban fabric. Uh, we see data boot camps, we see data science boot camps, master degrees focused around this. So the field continues to grow. And now it's, uh, we're, we're gonna be discussing how do we do that interoperability between Rhino uh, and this field of, of growing spatial analytics. So Rhino Compute, I believe, was first introduced around two or so years ago, and it's come a long way since then, thanks to community input. Uh, but it allows us to create a headless version of Rhino to run out Grasshopper scripts, to use the Rhino kernel, to have access to that Rhino common, whether through, um, through C Sharp or potentially even Python. So the, the technology step we're going to be going over today is taking Python, Grasshopper, and Rhino, uh, and specifically looking at how do we connect a Jupyter Notebook, which Jupyter Notebooks are specifically used by data scientists as a ways to give insight and do analytics quickly. And how do we connect that to Rhino Compute to do some spatial analytics? And how do we get data between the two? So this really is acting as like a module or a little nugget of that interoperability to get data to move back and forth. And we'll go over that later in the workshop. So it's important to note that this technology stack can be uh, very different depending on how you want to deploy it for your own office or your own solution. So you can think of it as Grasshopper as a front end, where that is what the user is interacting with, where they're adjusting a Grasshopper script. They can call Rhino Compute uh, and potentially even using C Python to create a flat server to call Python scripts as you need them within your Grasshopper. You can be interacting with a web visualization, manipulating geometries, and we're seeing that a lot within our field from all these startups focusing on making a web visualization and potentially doing geometry manipulations in the back end, And they can be connecting that with the Python server. And what we're gonna be focusing on is that we're in a Jupyter notebook and we're gonna be interacting with a uh, random compute. And then you can connect that later with a web visualization to visualize those insights. But we'll be doing mostly all the entire workshop in Rhino or in Jupyter notebook. So, and ultimately what we found, at least in our experience is why to connect the two is that we're, we're hearing these buzzwords around smart city, smart urbanism, 
And for us, what it starts to mean down, come down to is that we're doing analytics on a larger scale than just our building. It's architects are now being asked to think about not just what the building impacts are for the occupants and the tenants, which is incredibly important, but also what does that mean for the larger site analysis? You know, what does that mean for the larger context of a city when you place a new building within that context? Uh, and now uh, we'll go into a little bit about the workflow, and this will be explained a little bit later uh, in the actual workshop part of the interactive workshop, but we'll be taking uh, an open space ratio as a float, uh, a site curve, a building height, procedurally generating some geometry, and then doing daylight analysis, all within a Jupyter notebook using Rhino Compute. Uh, and now we're actually gonna move on to the installation. So with that, I'll actually move over to the GitHub I sent out, and I'll go over the installation steps, and feel free to tag it in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, if you had any issues with the installation, but I'll go over some common issues that we found with in the last workshop and hopefully those can resolve your issues here. So uh, what we're going to start with is Anaconda. Anaconda is a distribution of Python that allows us to create uh, little silos of uh, dependency packages. So what that means is that if you want to work with a specific workshop or a specific workflow that you know has maybe potentially outdated packages that you don't want to affect the rest of your computer, Anaconda allows us to create those virtual environments interactively with a nice interface and gives us a command line CLI to use it. So to install Anacondas, you follow this link and it will take you to uh, this page to install it for Windows. Uh, you can download the Anaconda installer. And from there, uh, once you have Anaconda installed, you'll have a, actually I need to reshare my screen to share the entire screen. Let's see here, there we go. So you'll have a screen much like this. Uh, where you'll have different channels. And this is what I was showing earlier that you can create additional channels and a channel is essentially one new silo of your environment. So in my case, I have my base, which is my default. And I also have a geo channel. And that's where I have like, in my case, geo pandas installed. Uh, so if you had any issues with geo pandas, my suggestion would be to create a new channel and use the conda forge command uh, that I outlined earlier. So to open up this command prompt in Anaconda, you either can do it through the PowerShell here, that the PowerShell prompt or the command prompt. And what that will do, in my case, you click on launch, it will open up either the PowerShell, the command prompt, depending on what you, what you type in. And the important piece to note is this. This tells me that I'm in my geo channel of the Anaconda environment. And a way to uh, see what you have installed Let's say I have, I know I have GeoPandas installed. So I'll type in pip show GeoPandas. And what that'll tell me, it will show me what version of GeoPandas I have installed successfully within that environment. So uh, moving on, this is how you type in all your commands. So for Jupyter Lab, if you don't have it installed, you just copy this and type it into here and you'll install Jupyter Lab. Um, and the same goes for all the other dependencies as well. Um, for Rhino 3DM, which is a, a Python distribution of CPython, that gives you access to the Rhino Common. Uh, matplotlib, which we'll use in the workshop to do some very quick visualizations of plots. Uh, GeoPandas allows us to take a data frame from the pandas library and spatially map that within the Jupyter Notebook. It depends on GDAL, which can be a little cumbersome, as I mentioned before, on Windows machines. So if you have any issues, feel free to uh, drop it in the chat and we can try to resolve those issues um, during this time. And the last package here, at least on the Python side, is the sklearn package, which is a machine learning package that is widely used within a data science field. Uh, all the packages are free, and it gives you access to so many algorithms to run different machine learning algorithms, um, all in Python, and they work natively with the pandas library or the pandas data structure. And then we have uh, Ladybug, and for this workshop, we'll be using Ladybug 1.2 and Grasshopper Hops. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Grasshopper Hops workflow, uh, essentially, what you have to do is open up Rhino 7. So I'll go ahead and open up Rhino 7 on my machine. And in the, in the command line, just type in package manager. And then in the search bar, type in hops. And if you don't have it installed, and in my case, I already have it installed, you just go ahead and click install here. And that will install the hops package for you. Uh, and once you're done uh, installing it, you'll have to restart Rhino. And the one setting that I have outlined here is just to uh, un unhide the window. So what happens is whenever you open up Grasshopper when you have hops installed, 
uh, what it'll do is open up a Rhino Compute instance for you automatically. The only difference is uh, if you don't have this unchecked, it will automatically hide this interactive window to let you see the output of the Hop server. So you can see here, um, I didn't. All I did was open up Grasshopper within Rhino Seven after installing Hops, and the Rhino Compute server starts automatically. I believe they might be releasing a version that um, automatically um, has this unhid or hid. I think they're still figuring out what's the best for the community. Uh, if you do want debug information, like um, information dumped directly from your Grasshopper script while using Hops, uh, the one thing you have to do is go into your environmental variables and set that. So the way to do that is type an ENV in the bottom left-hand corner of your Windows machine, go to environmental variables, and here, if you don't have it already, um, you're going to be adding this Rhino Compute debug variable and setting it to true. And the only thing that does, it doesn't affect how Hops works as a service. It just gives you better debug information um, while you're working through projects. So with that, is there any initial questions on how to use on how on any of the installation pieces? And to double check if your Hops is working properly, you can see here at HTTP is running, or this is running on localhost. So you just go over here, you can type that into your search bar and type in version, and that should return um, the version of the hop server. So you can see here back in our window, we have a 200, which means the server successfully responded to that request. Um, so any initial questions so far on any of the installation and also feel free to drop them in chat too. Yeah, still going through the steps to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know it can be a lot. Um, the one that we've seen cause the most issue is just GeoPandas on Windows. If on Unix, it's great, but unfortunately, Hops does not work on Mac, um, so it only works on Windows. Uh, but yeah, GeoPandas can be a little cumbersome, so we apologize. It, it is uh, you can still go through the workshop, uh, most of the workshop without GeoPandas, but that just allows you to do the spatial part of the uh, workshop. Any initial questions or issues anyone's run into? Feel free to post it on chat. That's a little, if you have a question, maybe other people have questions too, and we're happy to work through them during this time. Uh, well, we have like 10 minutes, 10 more minutes allotted for any troubleshooting. Uh, then we'll go ahead and move forward. May I ask how to install Ladybug after download? Okay, so Ladybug. Uh, it actually has a unique install. I actually haven't seen this. Maybe this is becoming more common. Um, once you have Ladybug installed, what it gives you is a Grasshopper script. And you open that Grasshopper script and then run it in Grasshopper, and it will install all the dependencies for you. It has two little nodes, I believe. Um, so I can go ahead and download here. I'll stop my share and just get this downloaded. Um, so yeah, Ladybug gives you two little, um, I'll just go ahead and open this in Grasshopper to show everyone. It gives you two uh, little nodes in Grasshopper to run. I'll go ahead and reshare my screen. So let's see here. There we go. So I can open Grasshopper. And then I go over here and open up that ladybug. Um, if you open up the install instructions, it says, uh, or it's actually it's easier to use this. So you just drop this in here. And it has, um, you just literally click on true for the first one. And then it gives you some outputs of how to install. I already have it installed, so I'm not going to run this. Um, but you just go by one and go by two, and that will install Ladybug 1.2 for you. We tried using an old version of Ladybug with Rhino Compute and Hops, and it did not work. So we would, we've only been able to test effectively Ladybug 1.2 to work with uh, Rhino Compute. Um, just, just a quick suggestion here. So when you, um, let's say if you already have Ladybug installed and you want to kind of upgrade to 1.2 version, uh, ideally you want to remove them. I, I know there is a component that you can just, just remove the, the, the old version, uh, but that sometimes doesn't really, really remove it properly so that when you run it, you create some conflict. So it's better that you just, you know, go to your user object folder and the GHA folder and just remove them. Yep. Um, any additional questions? So no go on the geo pandas. Um, let's see here. Um, so I'm I'm reading the uh, the message you sent here, Mark. So 
Uh, did you try with um, Conda install or did you try with the Conda Forge? And just know the, the difference here is um, there's two different ways to install it here. So no, I just copied the Conda install. OK. So if that one doesn't work, uh, there's different reasons why it doesn't work on certain machines. It's a little bit hard to uh, guess what's going on on your on potentially your machine. What I would suggest and what we saw work in the other workshop for individuals who are having that same issue is go into Anaconda, go to channels and create a new channel, uh, create it here. Once you're in that new channel, spin up a PowerShell or command prompt, whatever one you want to use. And I would suggest trying to use, um, the reason we do that, we, we kind of just want to create a clean slate um, just because uh, sometimes GeoPandas, since it has so many dependencies on GDAL and other spatial libraries, it's sometimes easier to use Conda Forge. Conda Forge, as it is listed here, is a community effort to make a more robust dependency tree for the GeoPandas and more widely supported. So people, individuals who have had issues with just the typical Conda install have found success using Conda Forge in a new environment. So I would suggest trying that. And I can go ahead and paste this into the uh, into the chat Great. for Thank anyone you. who's having an issue. Any additional questions? The nice thing is that once you have it installed once, you won't have to deal with it uh, <laughs> again. Uh, OK. Let's see here. My Rhino Compute Terminal window is not showing up. So for the Rhino Compute Terminal, if we go into Grasshopper, the way to make sure it shows up is preferences um, and uncheck this right here. It says hide Rhino Compute console window. Once you've done that, just go ahead and exit out of Grasshopper and Rhino and reopen Rhino and reopen Grasshopper. And you should see it pop up. Uh, if you don't, please let us know. And this one right here, you should also have this checked off. It says launch local Rhino Compute at start. So this is launches a random compute instance when you start Grasshopper. So let us know if that works out for you. It's worth noting that even if you don't see this window, uh, it if you have it launching at start, random compute by default when you have hops installed is running. You just don't see the window for it. The useful part of the window is if you're debugging, you can see the outputs here. And it also just gives you verification on which port you're running in. By default, the compute instance should be running on 6001. But if for whatever reason you are, uh, that port is busy or occupied on your computer, it will iterate to the next number to a 6002, 6003, et cetera. So this just lets you know which port it's running on. I have a question here on how to set up the debug environment variable again. Totally fine. Yes, if you go in the left hand corner here, type an ENV and you'll see this window pop up to edit system environmental variables and click on environmental variable here. And in your system variables, uh, you can see mine right here. So if I click on edit, this is what it should look like. Rhino compute debug and set that to true. And the only difference here, Rhino compute, uh, the hop server will still work as intended. It, you'll just get better debug information if you have that variable model set to true. I know McNeil is just discussing about if you unhide the window, having that set on by default, but I think this is just one uh, one of those little pieces of the settings that you have to set up. Uh, so. And uh, another note on that on the the console window. So um, in case you know some of you might just when, when you launch Chris Hubbard and then he shows some, like an error message pop up, right? So you need to bypass that, otherwise your computer will get stuck there. So in, if you have that kind of um, of situation, then you need to make sure that you kind of uh, check that window and then and then click like OK or whatever um, to pass that. Any other questions before we move on? OK, I will go ahead and move on. And throughout the, the rest of this interactive workshop, as we're working in Jupyter Notebook or, or Jupyter Lab, I'll have sections where I'll stop and ask and ask for questions. So feel free to save your questions or post them on the chat and we'll get to them on each section. So what we're going to be doing here is to open up Jupyter Lab, if you've never opened it before, is in your Anaconda, you should, you should see this button called Jupyter Lab when you have it installed. You go ahead and click on launch. If you're more comfortable in uh, command prompts, 
to, to open up a Jupyter Lab, you type in Jupyter Lab and it'll go ahead and open up a window for you. Uh, one useful method that I do oftentimes is I will go ahead and go into the, uh, the, the, the windows that I want to open. I'll open up a, uh, or yeah, I, you can open up a PowerShell and start from there, but either start it from Jupyter the Anaconda here, or you can start from uh, the command prompt if you want. Um, it's important that this command prompt, again, is the command prompt created by Anaconda. So you should see the name of your environment, which should match up here. And in many cases, you might be working on base, in which case you'll just see base up there. And if you have a new environment that you need to go, type in conda, it's activate base. And now I'm back in the base. If I want to go back into my other environment, um, you can just see the notification here that I'm in either the base environment or my geo environment. And I can go ahead and paste that into the chat for anyone who's switching between environments. Uh, um, so with that, when you have Jupyter Notebook open, you will see, uh, you can navigate using this left-hand side. If you don't see this little navigation bar, click on the folder here and that will open and close it. Or if the, the quick hotkey is control B and that will open and close that navigation bar there for you too. So navigate to where you cloned down the GitHub repo that we sent out and go into notebooks and double click on this compute.ipynb. The IPYNB is the file extension for a Jupyter notebook and it will open up this notebook for you. So what we'll do here is I'll be going over very broad stroke of what Jupyter notebooks are. I'll go into how to use pandas as just as a data analytics tool. Then we'll move into how to do some quick visualizations, then the spatial analytics, and then some machine learning, and then how to move those analytics back into Rhino. And then how to use Rhino to pull geometry and information into your Jupyter notebook to run out analytics. So each one of those sections, we'll stop and ask, ask for questions. So, with that, I'll go ahead and get started here. So Jupyter Notebooks, as I said before, are a common way for data scientists and the data science community to pass off analytics to one another. They're, you can think of them as like within the AC industry, we pass off grasshopper scripts to one another. This is just another way that uh, the data science community does it. So they allow us to write Markdown and Python in the browser and allows us to see the outputs all in the same line, which is really useful when you're just trying to go through a narrative story or go through some narrative analytics. And so here to run a cell, each one of these is its own individual cell. So you can see here, all this is is Markdown. So this uses the most up-to-date Markdown version that is we're familiar with on GitHub. To run a cell, you can either uh, click on this play button, which runs the given cell you're on. You can tell which cell you're on by this little blue highlight, and you can click on different cells here. And the quick key to run a cell is shift enter. And that will run the cell um, either in Markdown or in code. To change whether or not you're running Markdown or code in a given cell, you'll see here, I can change it from Markdown to code to raw. The raw is just a plain .txt file or txt format. Not the most useful for our purposes, but here we can run a Markdown cell and uh, hi, I'm Markdown. And it's important, I'll just go ahead and restart this to make sure that I'm getting a fresh start. So it's important to know that Jupyter Notebooks do work in the uh, one global namespace. So even though I have this definition declared here and I'm calling it here in Python, if I don't run this cell before, we'll get a name error that this function is not valid. But if I go ahead and run this cell and then run this cell, we'll go ahead and get that namespace cleared up and be able to run that definition. So this uh, up here, you can see here, this is written in code. So you can run Python and Markdown all in the same place and get the outputs in line with your code. So this allows you to see code and see the outputs of that code all in line without having to um, export anything. So uh, moving on onto pandas. Pandas, uh, I'm sure many people have heard of it. It's a growing way for data scientists to navigate large data sets, dissect them, analyze them very quickly. Um, they're very similar to how they're stored in memory they're stored in matrices in memory, but the way we can think about them oftentimes is very similar to an Excel workbook. Uh, so where we have two different columns and when we put two different columns, which are called series together, they form a data frame. And so here we'll import the pandas library along with some settings. 
Uh, these settings up here just remove the, uh, the limitation on how many rows we can look at at any one time or how many columns. I do this because oftentimes it will try to cut off if you have like 500 columns, although that's a lot of columns for a data set, uh, it will just try to cut them off to make them more readable. Um, I like seeing them all. Um, NumPy is the backend technology that Pandas is based off of. And then we'll just be using these libraries throughout the workshop, which are some common Python uh, libraries that come installed with Python 3. So we'll go ahead and run that cell. And we'll go over a quick example of how Pandas works um, by looking at apples and oranges. So very similar to what we have here, we have two columns on apples and oranges. And to create a data frame from scratch, if you're not reading from like a CSV or an Excel file, you can create a dictionary with apples and oranges. And we have two uh, arrays here. And we load that in using pandas. Uh, this PD refers to the PD we've imported pandas as. So the pandas data frame library is imported as PD. And you'll see that throughout the notebook. So we go pandas data frame and we import it as a sample or as this dictionary and we load it in. And when we load that, we get to see the data frame of that pandas or of that uh, data set. So we see the two arrays we have indexed um, in the order that they were in that array. So a very quick way to look at some summary information of apples and oranges here is that you call something called describe on the data frame object. And what that gives you is a count, mean, standard deviations, and basic summary statistics of the data frame. And this is very useful if you're just starting out a project and you just want to summarize some information, just call describe, and it will give you all the summaries for each one of the individual columns in your data set. As I mentioned earlier, matplotlib is a library that allows us to do quick visualizations in pandas that's natively uh, works with it. And it's pretty amazing what um, the matplotlib library has. I haven't been able to find any, like, any way that I've wanted to visualize data that hasn't been covered by the matplotlib library. Um, there are other libraries that are similar to it, like Seaborn, but the really cool thing is that you can visualize information very quickly in very few lines of code. Um, so whatever this cycle is, um, you know, we can visualize that, and the actual visualization part is these lines of code here. And they have really great uh, documentation on how to use their library, so I highly suggest checking it out. Um, if you ever have questions on how to visualize something in Pandas or even in Python, you can um, you can take Python data structures that we're used to, like dictionaries, matrices, or arrays, and convert them to be visualized in, in matplotlib as well. But it works natively with the pandas data frame. So we'll go ahead and import that here. <clears throat> and we will, this value counts is another useful function that just gives us a summary of all the unique values in a column. So how many different zeros, ones, twos, and threes do we have in our apples data frame? Uh, we just have one of each. If we want to plot those, uh, we can call a dot plot, and this calls the matplotlib library on the data frame for apples, and it will visualize apples. It's worth noting that for any any column, you can just call plot. The only difference is you won't have all the labels um, that you have here, like x label, y label, and title. So that's a very quick way to summarize one of those. We can also look at that just as a definition and call it later, and we'll set up a definition here for setting the title, the x label, the y label, and plotting it. And so I can just pass in different um, parameters and visualize apples and oranges, the observations versus the total count for each observation. So right, uh, I'll stop there real quickly and ask if there's any questions so far on using pandas. I know this is a very broad stroke, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can, we'll go over this somewhat quickly. I do have every, almost every single line commented out, so I'm hoping that's going to be useful as you read through this, but feel free to ask any questions that you may or may not have or you may have <laughs> before we move on to analyzing a larger data set. Questions? Okay. With that, I will go ahead and move on to analyzing uh, Pluto data. So the primary land use tax lot output data set or Pluto is tax lot information collected on the tax lot level to collected by the Department of City Planning and Department of Finance. It is used primarily for tax purposes for buildings in New York City to report their tax withholdings on buildings. But it's really useful for architects to use because it gives us all this zoning and building information at the tax lot level at that lot area when we're doing new construction or potential construction in New York City. So here we call the pandas library and call read CSV. 
And this is that data set that I sent out this morning. Unfortunately, it was a little bit too big for GitHub since GitHub has a 50 megabyte limit. So within your um, library, once you unzip that, just place that in the data folder uh, and you'll, you'll have the CSV and the two PDFs here as well. So uh, if, you, if that doesn't work, you can always just have this call either a relative path or an absolute path. Um, and it will be able to pull the library up for you. But yeah, it should just be data nested within that, that top level folder and then the CSV. Um, apologize for that uh, inconvenience. I was trying to figure out the best way to send that data set. Um, you can also download it directly from Pluto. So here is the Pluto GitHub. One fun fact that I found out with the Pluto data set is as we're living in the age of all these cities are opening their data sets like on open data portals, the, the Pluto data set managed by the Department of City Planning is pretty unique is that they manage it exclusively on GitHub. And the really cool thing is if you find issues in their data set, because they have over 800,000 different tax lots that they manage collecting data from different departments, you can actually file an issue on their GitHub and they'll fix it pretty quickly. And I've never seen in my experience a data set be managed by a city so effectively. Um, and there's still, of course, room for improvement, but it's pretty cool to see how the Department of City Plan manages this data set. Uh, but here you can actually download the spatial file that we use. Um, I use it as a GeoJSON, but you can download a shape file. And also the CSV is also here too for direct download as well. Uh, so if we can go back to the Jupyter Lab and we're gonna call the data set, we're gonna look at how many rows there are. So the, how many rows equates to how many tax slots there are. And then we're gonna call the head. The head function here only returns the first five rows of the data set. So if you don't have head here, it will try to print out all the rows. In this case, it's 858,000. So you want to call the head just to get a quick synopsis of the data set you're looking at. So if we run that, um, this little asterisk next to the data frame or to the cell here actually just equates to that that cell is currently running and loading. And so while it's asterisk, it also means that um, it's loading, it's not frozen, it's not broken, it's just loading the data set um, or running the, the Python code that you have in that cell. So here we can see that we load in the, the, that CSV file and we have all that tax lot information loaded into memory. So we have information such as the address. We have information on the zoning designation for that tax lot. So we have, it's a residential tax lot for this case. We have information on land use. We have information on lot area and building area and a bunch of uh, data cells that give us um, quantitative information on that tax lot. Oftentimes when we start a project, we'll take a look at this data set just to know how much lot area and building area is there. Uh, if there's currently buildings there, how many number of fours are allowed given the zone designation, what's a lot depth, lot front. Uh, so it's really useful. I'm hoping to see more and more cities start adopting this way of collecting building information and making it public in this way. But it's been pretty impressive uh, by New York City. But moving on, well, actually, the first thing we're going to take a look at is um, land use. So we're going to take a look at land use and we're going to sort this data set, which currently contains all data for New York City. We're gonna filter it down to just Manhattan, grab the unique land uses for Manhattan, and then visualize them. So the first thing we're gonna do is grab all the boroughs uh, by their name and get all the unique boroughs. In New York City, we have the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Queens. So they're abbreviated here. So what we're gonna do to filter down a data frame you grab the data frame you currently want and then pass in a conditional here. In this case, we're asking the data frame, give me all the, the rows that have the borough name Manhattan and save that to this variable. So that gives us all the tax lots that are within Manhattan. And from there, we're gonna do some very basic analysis, just trying to see how many tax lots there are in Manhattan. In this case, uh, according to the Department of City Planning, uh, Manhattan data only has 42,000 lots where the entire data set has 858,000. So Manhattan only makes up around 5% of all tax lots in New York City. And this is of course including Staten Island and Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx. Uh, we look at lot area. So out of all the lot area, when we sum it up, it only makes up 7.39% of all lot area in New York City. And we look at building area. Uh, Manhattan only makes up 32% of all building area in New York City according to this data set. So it's pretty interesting just uh, in one or two lines of code, we can get some very quick summary statistics on this data set, summarizing 42,000 rows um, pretty quickly. Um, and so each one of these, oh, I just need to run this out. 
So I typically just hit shift enter and then I, it just runs the next row or the next cell after it. So again, let's look at the value counts for all land use. So these are all the unique counts of each land use category, but we can see here that they're all encoded um, by a float value. So if we open up this Pluto data dictionary and scroll down to land use, we can see here, these are the descriptive land use categories uh, encoded by these values. So what I've done in the notebook is I create a dictionary lookup that just renames those. So by using the dot replace, I assign a new category called land use cat. And by running that, we now have the descriptive values for land uses in Manhattan. So we can see the top land use in Manhattan uh, by the zoning designation is mixed residential and commercial buildings, followed by multifamily walk-up buildings. Um, lowest is, is industrial. So uh, one thing I wanted to do is I didn't include this on the uh, installation on purpose, but I wanted you to see that to install libraries in the Anaconda Python environment is typically pretty simple. I know GeoPandas can be a little bit to wrangle with, but here, if I say I found this code on Stack Overflow on some forum, oftentimes you'll see, oh, I need this library to run this. The easiest way to do that, you just go back into your uh, your window that has your environment and type in pip. If it's already installed, I already have it installed in my case. Um, so you just install Squareify, which is a library that allows you to create tree maps very easily. In this case, I'm, oh, I need to import it. And now I just made a, a very quick tree map of the uh, land uses in Manhattan. I, I needed to fix the, uh, you can you can fix the, the font size, which I probably need to do, but um, we can see multifamily and mixed use of the largest categories uh, of land use. And that was created just with one line of code. And so I think the one of the powerful parts of the Pandas library is that the community who's supporting this, just like in Grasshopper, is growing exponentially. So the libraries you'll find to do whatever you need are pretty, pretty uh, robust. So before moving on to the spatial analytics and a little bit of machine learning, I'll stop and take any questions anyone has so far. Any questions, concerns? I know it's a lot of information. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, so with that, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. When we get to the next little break point, we'll go ahead and answer them. So we'll move on to some spatial analytics and k-means clustering. Uh, using GeoPandas and SKLearn. So here's where you import GeoPandas. Uh, hit Shift Enter, or again, you can always click on Play, and that will run the cell as well. So SKLearn is an open source machine learning library that allows you to run supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, it's very robust. It's used by most data science institutes that I'm aware of. Uh, use this library for teaching and even in production models it's used. So in our case, we're going to be using k-means. In a very TLDR on k-means clustering, it's one of the clustering algorithms provided by the sklearn library. And what it does is essentially it tries to look through all your dimensions of data. Each dimension of your data set is each variable. And it tries to classify new data points that it sees. So it gets a new data point. It says, hey, is that, does this data point belong in group blue? Does this data point belong in cluster green? Or does this data point belong in cluster yellow? It does this by comparing the different characteristics of that data point across all dimensions and searches for similarity. And it does this by creating what you call tight clusters by minimizing the mean square distance of each data point within that cluster of the algorithm. And we'll see how that works later on. So here, we're gonna be reading in the GeoJSON file that was uh, provided along with the GitHub. Here, we're just filling in all the zeros or all the null values. We do this just because k-means only takes in numerical values. And if we have any nulls, we seem to convert those into zeros. Uh, there's different uh, thought processes on how you deal with nulls. But for our example, we'll just fill them with zeros. So here, I'm going to go ahead and hit Shift Enter. And this is going to load in this GeoJSON file. And it's worth noting that this GeoJSON file can be a shapefile too. And it will load in exactly the same way. So here, very similar to how we load in that CSV. Uh, we loaded in the GeoJSON. It's worth noting too that this GeoJSON, I just converted this to GeoJSON from the shapefile here that was provided. And uh, the only difference here from the CSV is that now we have a geometry column. And that geometry column is allow us to do the, the spatial analytics part. 
So here we're going to do look at built FAR across Manhattan. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and run this cell. And while it's running, what we're doing is looking at built FAR across the entire Manhattan borough data set. And then uh, the reason I filter it to only max FARs of 35 is because we found we found an error with the data set where it has an FAR for one building that is 400. And uh, I somewhat doubt there's an FAR in Manhattan that has 400 um, for the area ratio. So when we look at FAR here, this building must be an error. Uh, I doubt it has an FAR of 400. But if we filter it down to 35, we start seeing the distribution of density across Manhattan. So as we would expect, we see some we see density in Midtown, the Hudson Yards, Chelsea area. We see density around the financial district and a little bit on the Upper West Side. So this was a very quick way just to visualize the spatial data is you literally type in the, uh, the Manhattan Geo lots data, you type in plot, give it a column to visualize, turn on the legend, and then it visualizes it for you. So the nice thing about Jupyter Notebooks, again, is that you have the code here along with the visualization all in one place that you can go ahead and iteratively change as you go through, which gives you a lot of flexibility and allows you to hand this off to someone else to see your code and see your outputs all in one place. So what we're going to do next is move on to clustering the data using k-means, and then we're going to move that data back into Rhino. So let's say we want to cluster this data based on land use, residential FAR, commercial FAR, facilities FAR, and number of floors. And you can, you can cluster on any numerical outputs. So you can cluster on office area, on retail area, on any of these numerical values. So in our case, I'm assigning all these values to the cluster data set or cluster data variable. And you do that just by passing in a bracket and another bracket within, just listing out which columns you want to grab. So from there, you can see we create a new data frame for land use and these other variables that we wanted. And from there, what we're going to do is first uh, pre-process them and normalize them, just because k-means wants values between 0 and 1. So we normalize all the values between those so it can reach convergence and properly run. And from there, we're going to loop through uh, an array. And it's worth seeing just how this quick little function works, this np arrange. It uses the NumPy value or the NumPy library to create a list. So this is saying from start from 2 and go to 20 in increments of 2, but you can go to 50 in increments of 1. I use this function all the time just to create myself very quick arrays, um, very similar to what we use in Grasshopper. So what we're doing here is in increments of 2, we're going to run the k-means cluster model um, and fit it and then run a prediction. And that prediction is going to allow us to see which cluster of the tax slots works best. And we're going to judge it based on how tight those clusters are based on the mean square distance. And so I'm going to run this. And again, this little asterisk next to the cell tells us that it's running. So this one does take a sec. Um, the more clusters you run, each time it's going to run a loop and run through one of those clusters, and then it'll visualize it in the same way that we visualized the maps earlier. In this case, I'm giving it the um, color map of blue, giving it a figure size, um, and telling it to call the cluster category column that we're creating here once we get the response from the prediction and we assign it to that value. So as it's running, I can hear my computer. I'm sure other computers are spinning up. The k-means cluster is surprisingly works well, even with larger data sets. Um, what actually takes the most time here is just the visualization part. Uh, getting the response from this prediction cluster for the k-means actually runs pretty quickly. And it was surprising to me, at least when I started data science, about how easy these tools are now. To run a k-means, it's three lines of code, uh, which is pretty surprising. You know, you kind of hear machine learning data science, but when you start digging into it, I mean, there's a lot of conceptual building to know what those pieces mean, but it's surprising how little code you need to run it. Um, and what we're going to do after that runs is look at what we call the elbow method. And what that means is that we're going to judge based on the mean square distance of each cluster to see at which point do we gain the most intelligence. Uh, and here we can see that we have at two clusters, we don't get much differentiation. But as we run each cluster of k-means, we start getting more and more differentiation of the tax slots, meaning that the algorithm was able to find more characterization of each one of the tax slots based on the characteristics that we fed into it. And the elbow method is just one method of finding what number of clusters you want. 
So here we can see that at two, the clusters are very far apart and they're not very distinct. And as we go through four clusters, six clusters, eight clusters, and 10, we start getting more and more tightly knit clusters. And what that means is that like from 10 to 12, we don't really gain that much more information. So if we're trying to think about computational time and we run this in production, we can say, okay, like we can either stop it at 10 or 12 and we're not gaining that much more insight or the algorithm isn't learning that much more um, at that given point. So we can stop at 10, let's say. So here I'm um, saying the number of clusters is equal to 10 and I'm running the exact same code here with number of clusters um, equal to the optimal number here and running out um, a slightly larger visualization to see what that looks like. And then once this runs, we'll, uh, we'll take a, a quick second for questions and we'll get into saving this data back into Rhino uh, using the Rhino Compute Library. So here we can see which tax slots are similar to one another based on their color shading because each one of them is assigned to a different cluster. So with that, uh, do we have any questions so far? Questions, curiosities? Are there any good sources of data for the UK? I haven't found, at least for the Puyo data set in London, I know uh, I found some information, I think on the ward level, but it doesn't really give you building information. Um, but I know London is continuously building out its open data portal. Um, but I haven't found tax law information as it is in London for, uh, in the same way that the Pluto data set here is in New York. No, I think that's a little bit harder to find. That's true. Yeah. Maybe some open street map data, let's say. But again, yeah. that's down to the community who's putting it up there, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I'm hoping that as we're seeing more and more cities open up their data portals, that they'll be collecting this level of information. So you just use the notebook to look at the data and, and then you're just porting it out to somewhere else for visualization and or presentation. Sure, right? yeah. So as we mentioned before, I think in this, no, this one, is that Jupyter Notebook at the end of the day is just running Python. You know, it's giving you a visual layer to understand, unravel, and visualize that data. But you can just insert a Flask server in lieu of a Jupyter Notebook and take the code you have in Jupyter Notebook and put it as a Flask endpoint, and then call that either from a web visualization, from a, another API that you connect to hops in uh, Grasshopper, as Ping Shing had mentioned earlier. But this is just a visual way to explore data and then export it out and bring it into Rhino. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, well, with that, I will go ahead and dive into the next section here. So here we will actually be using the Rhino 3DM library provided by McNeil. Uh, and we're gonna be importing this. I also realized I may have missed this on the uh, on the GitHub, is that you might have to install this as well if you don't have it installed. So if you don't have this installed, uh, you can go ahead and install it. I'll tap it here into the chat or nope, to run this cell out. And that will import the Rhino library. The tricky bit there is what I noticed actually, um, because I just have it running up now. The Python needs to be 3.7 or above for the Rhino 3D library. Oh, that's so I actually, I actually needed to create my environment specifically with a version 3.7 or, gotcha. or higher, gotcha. let's say, because the default good, for me wasn't. That's a good point of clarification. I think, are you using Anaconda for yes. your environment? Yeah. Okay. I think I could have sworn Anaconda came with 3.7, but yeah, it might to if you're ever I installed it a, a year ago or so. So, so oh, okay. it's probably <laughs> so if you're ever curious to know which Python version you're running in your environment, just type in Python dash dash version and they'll show you. So I'm running Python 3.8 uh, for point of reference. Uh, and that's just how you check if and also this happens a lot too, is um, it's always good to check your pip environment 
uh, Python environments, like many other environments, sometimes aren't always the most intuitive, but uh, this is how you can do a quick check for your Python and pip, which is the most common. Because the funny thing is, it didn't actually give an error while installing. It was just saying the wheel, building wheel or something, oh, and it was just keep on spinning. Yeah, um, I'm curious. So if you get that, yeah. it's a version version thing. I think, I wonder if they have which version supported here. I saw it somewhere. Yeah. 3, 7, 3, 8. Yeah, so it's probably 3, 7 or above. Right? Is that what you have? Yep. Okay. Now so, I do, yes. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So once you have that installed, the cool thing about um, running this environment is that if for whatever reason you don't have this installed, if you run the command in your um, command here and install it and rerun the cell, it will be available for that. So you don't have to restart your entire notebook. It will be available to pull because it pulls it live from the package library. So I'll go uh, line by line here. This is just how I chose to export the data. So again, we're going to be taking this data set and exporting it into Rhino with the cluster information attached to it. So this is an example of you guys, you just got done doing some spatial analytics using Jupyter Notebook or whatever other algorithms, and you just want to bring that data back into Rhino for use. So here we're going to create the Rhino 3DM object, the file object using file 3DM. We're going to be looping through the Manhattan geolocks that we created. And we're going to create a point object that we're going to be using to create all those points that it's going to eventually create those curves. And we're going to create an object table uh, for those curves as well. And here, we're actually going to be looping through the geometry column of the, uh, of the geometries here. And it's important to note that these, ge these geometries, as they exist in data, in the Pluto data set and many other GIS data sets, they exist as lat longs. So we're going to be taking those and putting those into Rhino and converting them. So I'm creating those point objects. Once I loop through all those points and have them added here, I'm adding the X, Y, and for this instance, I'm adding a zero for the Z. Uh, here, you don't have to, uh, you can imagine that if you want to add additional information, maybe potentially on building height, you can add a number here if you had that data. Uh, and I'm creating a nerves curve. I'm using the default values for these two first parameters, and then I'm passing in the points to create that curve. So now for each one of those polygons, um, I've essentially created a curve in the Rhino 3DM. And I'm scaling it just to make sure it's the right scale back in Rhino. Uh, this uh, is a scale that I had to find by measuring. So this is what I found works for uh, most GIS. Uh, for anything projected in CRS WGS84, which is the common um, coordinate reference system, here is where we actually attach the data. And we're assigning it the name cluster. And we're giving it the name um, passing in as a string the cluster categorization for that given polygon. And once we're done there, we add it to the Rhino file object. Then here, I'm setting the unit modeling system to meters. In this case, it's set by the number four for the encoding. And then I go ahead and write that to disk. So if I run this, we'll get the little asterisk here. And once it's done writing, writing to disk, you should see it in your Rhino folder. Uh, once it's done, once it's done uh, creating, it's going to create in the Rhino. So if I go ahead and open this up, let's see here. And there we go. So I'm going to go ahead and open this in Rhino 7. And let's see what we created. And one point of uh, apologies here. I uh, forgot to move when I wrote this notebook. I forgot to move it back to the world. So um, it's just offset a little bit. So apologies for that. I just needed to move it back. But if we uh, load it in here, we can see we have all those polygons that we created earlier. And it looks like Manhattan. So we created those successfully. And if we look on each one of these polygons and go to its properties and then to the attribute table, we have the cluster information here. So this is a way for you to take the analytics that you create in the Jupyter Notebook or in Python and move it back into Rhino. So now this data is available for you in the Rhino instance. And in, in a way, it's also available for you um, in the Grasshopper and the user string of that object, which is pretty powerful because you can just create key value pairs for the data you want to move back and forth. Um, this is the way we found successful when we're doing this analytics on the fly, when we're moving data back into Grasshopper for more analysis. So any questions um, up to this part here? Questions, curiosities, <laughs> happy to answer. Also need to take a drink of water. 
have to give respect to all the teachers who who uh, have been teaching, you know, teaching nonstop and talking for two hours. So does this end up being faster than like doing this from Grasshopper with some of these pieces? I mean, obviously you can't do the Python three, but like downloading, you can download a lot of that stuff and set the data. Um, Cause I've done that like with Kangaroo and everything and it takes so much longer. Um, yeah, what I've found, I found it both ways. We've been trying to test it in house. For instance, <laughs> we ran out um, some climate analysis for every single city for the EPW files that were available and we, I tested it in Grasshopper, running out like 10 of them compared to calling it in Python and running out using Python Pew. It almost, I, this is completely anecdotal based on a small test. I felt like I was able to do it quicker in Python calling Rhino Compute than I was back in Grasshopper. <clears throat> um, now I timed it and it was only for 10 of them, it ran in two minutes faster in Python. Um, Cause each one of them, we were running out many, many different analytics for each weather file. Uh, so that's completely anecdotal and it's a whole different piece, but I think it's, it depends is what we found. Sometimes it's faster. I think what sometimes takes longer is the visualization piece in Grasshopper. If you're making graphs or visualization in Grasshopper, it feels like that takes a little longer than it is to run it in Python. So if you just get your values, like as arrays or as dictionaries and show those and pull those into Python and do your visualization there, that's a little faster. And potentially if you just use the Rhino kernel or the Rhino compute just as another API to do your geometry or, or simulation and don't do visualization, that's actually really fast. Any other questions? No? Okay, we'll move on to the next section of the workshop. So I will go ahead and move back to the notebook. So now we will get back into Grasshopper Hop. So in this section, we're actually gonna be pulling data from a Rhino file and then running out the Grasshopper files using Rhino Compute. So as we mentioned in the earlier workshop is that uh, you can use the package manager to install the Hops component. Once you have it installed, go ahead and restart Rhino and follow the additional steps here just to unhide the compute window once you are once you have it installed. And this just makes sure that when you run Grasshopper, it will show the window. In other cases, uh, when you're not like actively debugging, you might want to switch this back on because you, maybe you don't want that window up, but for debugging, it's really useful. So here, I'm going to go ahead and start a Reno start Grasshopper. And as we saw earlier, just by typing in Grasshopper. Actually, I'll go ahead and open up our test file, I think. Yeah, I'll go ahead and open up the test file that we have. So I'll go here, Rhino. And in that Bryant Park zip is where I sent that test file. So you can go ahead and unzip that and just place it within that um, Rhino file structure. And here I'm going to open up Rhino 7, that Bryant Park example. Um, this is a, a little fun example we use in-house just to run out different tests. Uh, it's an abstracted version of Bryant Park. Uh, obviously, Bryant Park does not have a river next to it, but we just wanted to, uh, for test purposes, for different um, of our settings, we, we created it that way. And the Empire State Building is much closer. <laughs> um, but so here, we're just going to be using this Rhino test file. We're going to be pulling this site from the test file. Um, here, we have context, we have a site, and we want to run some analysis exclusively in Python. So. To run that, we're going to go ahead and open up Grasshopper, and that will start up our Rhino Compute instance. So as Grasshopper spins up, it's loading all the libraries and plugins. And it's worth noting, any library or plugin that you have installed on the Rhino, it's available on that Rhino Compute uh, server, like that server you build up. It pulls from the same place, so you don't have to install it in different places. So whatever you have installed in Rhino, and if it works in Rhino as you're using the interface in Rhino and Grasshopper, it also should theoretically work on the server. So there hasn't, I haven't in our experience, haven't seen too much differences if it works in Rhino and it doesn't work. One issue we have found is that we only found Ladybug 1.2 working um, where it works in Rhino, but it does not work on the server. And I think that has to do with what we've nailed it down to is like how it, how the old Ladybug passes right or passes data between the Python document uh, or that what Python active docs, but it seems to be resolved in Ladybug 1.2. So what we're going to be doing here is now that we have our instance and it's spun up, again, to, to check that, to make sure it's running, you can always type in the version here 
and you'll see it return. And then you'll also see it return a 200 here. And it's the exact same thing in this cell. You're just doing an HTTP request to grab the version. And we're seeing it that our Jupyter notebook is now hooked up to the Rhino Compute instance just by terms of local host. And we had a question in the previous uh, course that we'll answer here is that this URL can be your local host. It can be a remote server. In our in-house case, we have our own compute server that we use um, to connect to. So that means that like, everyone in the office doesn't have to install the libraries. It just means that they connect to our cloud instance. So it allows us to centralize all those Grasshopper scripts and those plugins. And whenever someone on our team runs a compute instance, they just call our own internal local or our own internal Rhino compute server. And it works really well just because it allows us to centralize the Grasshopper scripts, the plugins, and we don't have to worry about dependencies. Because if someone introduces a new Grasshopper script, we just install it on the remote server, restart it, and it's available for use. So here are just some top level functions we'll be using throughout this section. Uh, this Rhino 3DM encoder is actually from McNeil. So shout out to McNeil for giving us this nice encoder um, function that just allows us to encode it for transportation on JSON. And we're also just having some uh, functions here to get the breps um, from the Rhino file and get the curves. So here I'm calling the Rhino, um, I'm just going back into that Rhino folder here and grabbing that Bryant Park 3DM file. And then I'm gonna read it. And you can just use the Rhino 3DM file read. We're gonna get the curves from that Rhino file. And then we're gonna encode it uh, in preparation to send it on to the Rhino compute. And we're also gonna grab those context breaths using that function before. And once it's done, you should see geometry encoded and ready to go. So now our geometry is all ready to go. And as we showed earlier, this is the workflow we're gonna be using. We're gonna be taking an open space ratio, a site curve and a building height. And we're gonna be procedurally generating some geometry using the, the grass script provided and given a site curve and we're gonna do some daylight analysis. So here, uh, you can copy these for whatever grasshopper script that you want. Um, so this is how you encode them in preparation to send as a JSON payload to the Rhino compute server. Uh, so you can, I copy and paste this each time whenever I have to use a new Rhino compute and you can feel free, just type in whatever grasshopper script you want uh, and encode it there. I know that uh, the way I did it originally that I probably just continue to use is using GHX and uh, XML format. Um, there is a way to use Grasshopper scripts, and that doc that's documented on the. Um, there is some documentation on how to use that as well. But I just use GHX whenever I'm ready to send it onto XML, just because it's a little easier translation for me, at least mentally. So here, as we talked about before, we're going to be using two float values. So in this case, an open space ratio. So let's say I want a lot of open space, so 80%, and I want to adjust the floor height just to 20. Here is the structure that Rhino Compute ingests. So it takes a param name and it takes these data structures where it wants to know the type and then you provide your data in that data variable. So we have the open space ratio, the floor height and the site curve. And this just show you how that connects back into your grasshopper. I'll go ahead and open that up for you. So let's go ahead and open up the geometry here. So we have a lot of geometry and you can dig through this um, on your own, but we just wanted to show that this is how you connect that Rhino compute. So you're essentially creating some endpoints here. So we have site, floor height, open space ratio. And you can see that corresponds to these. So this is what's gonna be plugged into those when it runs it on the Rhino compute instance. So when we're running this on the compute, we're not actually running it here. It's running everything on the compute instance. So this, again, this instance can be on your local computer. It can be on a server. It can be on a local work machine in your office that's on network. So this can really be anywhere. Uh, so here we're going to prepare it for JSON uh, to pair it to send it as a payload on an HTTP request, deserialize it, and get some and get some numbers from it as outputs. Oh, I just need to run that. So you run that cell, and then you're going to run this cell, and we can actually see the outputs here. So my computer's spinning up, running it. This one takes uh, three to five seconds to run in my in my experience, uh, and this is procedurally generating those different geometries. So there we go. I can see I generated 25 buildings, and these are some of the outputs of the floor area. So if I want to potentially generate more buildings and less open space, I can drop this down to 40% and rerun it. 
And it's important to note that one really cool feature on the Rhino Compute is that they actually have a caching feature where the very first time you run, it's going to have to you know, basically build out that Grasshopper script. But each time, each time it runs after that, it has certain variables saved. And that's particularly useful um, in running simulation data is that, you know, let's say on Ladybug, you have to build the Sky Dome for some kind of daylight, which we'll get into in a bit. Uh, it's really useful the first time you run it, it's a little slower, but once it's cached, uh, it will just change those inputs and rerun the script, which is quite useful um, when running things in production. That's a little bit faster on the response. So what we're going to do here is actually take that geometry output and send it on to a Grasshopper script here. And that Grasshopper script I'll outline over here. Go ahead and open that up just to show you how it connects. So this is using Ladybug 1.2, and this one does take a little longer to run. So we're giving it a site curve. We're giving it some buildings and a weather file. One thing you're going to have to change on your computer is I was trying to get this to run with a relative path, but I was having mixed um, issues. So what you can do on your computer is if you go into your running compute workshop and go to the EPW file, hold shift and right click it, you'll get copy as path and just copy that path into your into this feature. The only thing you have to do is that you have to escape it um, with double slashes for Windows. Um, so it's annoying, but you that's the only annoying part I found of this workflow is that Windows just requires the double escapes. So you'll just have to escape it twice um, for the encoding. And then you can send the EPW file along with it. In our, uh, in our system in-house, we typically just have that saved on our server. So it just pulls from the local instance. And we don't have to deal with that necessarily. We just give it the name of the city. In this case, we're running it for New York Central, Central Park. Uh, so here, we're going to go ahead and run this out using the geometry we generated earlier and the site curve that we grabbed earlier. And this one, for the very first time, it has to build out that sky dome. So this one does take a little bit longer to run. Uh, but in the meantime, does anyone have any questions so far? Oh, perfect. Timon has a, oh, but I got your name, Timon? Uh, it's, yeah, it's Timon. Um, just a tiny little tip that those, I hate those double slashes too in Windows. <laughs> Um, but if you put an R in front of a single quoted string, you can skip the double slashes. Does that treat it as a relative path? It, no, that just uh, tells it to read the string as it is without special characters because the okay. slash is a special character. So that's a Python thing with the windows. Anyways. No, it's a super, great, super great tip. Yeah, double slashes <laughs> are super annoying. You know, it's tough for working. Oh, really good. You've got a lot of content in here packed in. Um, I'm getting an error right now with zero buildings getting generated, but I assume it's something on my computer um, in that cell under prepare request payload. Um, I don't know if something was what, open. Um, what value do you have for open space? For open space, 0 0.6, the ratio. Yeah, the open space ratio. Um, did you were you able to prepare the site curve properly by getting? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, the, the error I'm getting is on line sixty three, where it says the index of the list doesn't match, and so it looks like that RH out max area. Maybe the tree structure is different or something. Um, we really don't have. Oh, control, I see. But I imagine I don't know if other people are getting the same problem or not. So yeah, a way to debug that is what's happened there is that this is calling very specifically to that tree structure, but what might happen here, um is if you hit B below a cell, you can create more and more cells here. So what I would typically do is look into that response object, and it might be a little bit large, but we'll see what it looks like here. And it looks like our daylight ran, but I'll go ahead and open this up. So this is going to this is gonna print out what this response object looks like. Mm. So we can see here that in your case, maybe your open space variable um, might be assigned to a different parameter when it outputs. So you can see here, we're calling into this very specific structure. Um, and this is catered to this specific structure mm -hmm. that it outputs from running compute. So I'd imagine maybe on your max area or your max billings, maybe one of these is incorrect on yours. But this is how I typically debug by looking at that response object we get back. Okay, cool. And we can, we can see a lot of uh, geometry data here <laughs> in that geometry. Um, so you can, you can always uh, control slash and comment something out and then run that and then it'll, it won't print it out. Uh, so here, we actually got to the run out a daylight analysis value. 
Um, and this is just to show that you can connect your Jupyter notebook to your to your Rhino instance by pulling geometry and running those Grasshopper scripts without ever having to theoretically open Grasshopper. Um, you can move this data back into uh, Rhino, and this because this geometry is Rhino geometry. But so we're hoping that this is helpful in op opening up those doors as a particular you know nugget or module to show you how it's used. Um, I have an optional workflow here. Uh, it's a little bit more advanced, just showing some more spatial analytics that I, I have found useful in my practice. Uh, so if you have any additional questions, I can uh, we can answer those, and then we can potentially, if we have some time here, we can move into the uh, an optional workflow here. I think this team, this group moved much faster or less questions. So if you had a lot more questions in the first class. I know it's a lot of content too, so. <laughs> It is, but it's it's really great. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm stuck in the K means part of the. Sure. It it's just I'm I'm playing the cell. Oh, that took um, forever. Looping through different clusters, but yeah, how long does it take? That's basically my question. Sure, I think depending on your machine, it can take anywhere from um, one to two minutes at most. What I would suggest is maybe just decreasing yeah. this to four. And, and again, just to see how that runs, like what that list looks like. Because um, oh. it's it's been on for uh, last modified, it says six minutes. So. Oh, wow. That's that's really long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's about mine took probably 15 minutes or something while oh, really? we talking. Okay. Um, so. OK. Um, yeah. Probably killing it and reducing it and starting it over. Not just killing that one cell, right? You can do that, Brandon? Yeah. Yeah. You can um, stop the. The process of that one cell. Um, mm -hmm. So you can either restart the entire kernel or you can stop that cell by hitting stop and it'll stop the current operation. Yeah. And if you restart, it will restart the entire notebook um, and basically reset all your variables. So if you want a clean start. Um, I, again, I think what takes the longest in this particular cell is the visualization because it's, it's drawing all these. But mm -hmm. if you're just trying to get the values, you could comment this out and just run. Um, you can comment out the state, like the graph stuff and just get the values. And then, you know, if you were, if I was in production running this just to um, get the values, I wouldn't be doing the visualization. We would just be getting those cluster inertias, which are here, which gives you that squared mean distance and uh, doing the elbow method. in, in this case in particular, uh, to know which, how many clusters I want to run finally. Um, and then doing one final visualization at the end. So if you're stuck on that part, feel free, you can skip this. This is just to show the iteration. And uh, you can just go ahead and run the single value here um, with the number of clusters that you want. So if you want 12, you can run 12 here um, and have that run to get the, to the next value, to use those to save to uh, Rhino 3DM. Uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely the visualization because if I comment that out, it's it's just going instantly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's the, it's the painting. <laughs> Um, so cool. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's typically where I start whenever, especially on grasshopper, when I've transitioned certain grasshopper scripts to run a compute, run on our server in house, the first thing I cut out is all the visualization components because that I really just want the data, right? We just want those numbers, those values, those arrays. And once you cut that out, we get a, a huge increase in computation. Yeah. Unless you want to like serve out this as a PNG image or save it as an SVG, if you're trying to show it on a website, um, that can be useful too. But it just mean, I think it means that you just have to have more GPU cores on your instance. And probably Zoom is using them all at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I, I am using my, my big rig here to run this. That's probably why it's maybe a little faster on mine. Um, running the 1080 because we all know it's impossible to find anything else. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, we can move on to a little bit more, uh, maybe uh, optional workflow here. So this is something that I found I wanted to share with everyone just as a, uh, an optional workflow, just to do some different spatial analytics that I have found very useful in my practice. So to install these, uh, you're going to use the same pathways that we've shown before is I would just look on SciPy for these. Um, it's Folium, which allows us, you don't need to install Folium, but you do need to install Shapely, which comes from the, uh, or that this actually comes from the GeoPandas workflow or part. 
and the flex polygon, this is actually from the here API. And I guess I should back up. What we're gonna be doing here is taking an address and seeing from that address, how far can that pedestrian travel in five minutes or however many distance you want. And we're gonna be doing that just by calling the here API. If you're not familiar, it's an API I use often. It gives you uh, traffic information and road features information. And you can also call this into Rhino if you just want to call as an API in the Python. But it gives you really interesting insight into how far a car, a pedestrian, or a bicyclist can travel on foot or by those different modes, um, either by time or distance. In our case, we're going to be querying that based on, uh, let's say, the KPF address in New York. We're going to be geocoding that using OpenStreetMaps. And uh, this is really useful. You can plug in. Uh, this just encodes the URL for the address. And using OpenStreetMaps, we're going to get a lat long response. Um, I use this code all the time, and I hope it's useful for everyone else just to do a simple encoding using OpenStreet. Uh, here, uh, this is my API key, but I would encourage you to go to here API to create your own. Uh, the reason I use it over Google Maps, just because you get 250 transactions for free per month, which is really useful if you're just doing some spatial analytics for a project. And it offers a huge amount of traffic information that we don't typically get for free. So it's a data set that I found really useful. Um, and you, it has hard limits that you don't, you can make sure you don't go over your 250,000 per month. But if you're just doing spatial analytics, unless you're doing like a recursive function, you probably won't be going over that per month. So it's a really useful library. Um, so here we're going to be saying, we're going to be traveling by pedestrian. So on foot, I'm going to say, how far can I get from the KPF office in five minutes? Give me the fastest route possible. Uh, it's going to be given in time. So this is saying in time, five minutes. And we're going to be running this query. And once successful, it means that I've created an, an ISO line and gotten that query here. I have this pretty well commented out. So I hope that's useful as you go through it. And in here, we're just going to be mapping that using the Folium library. So here, what I did is I actually queried the Pluto data set using their API. So again, this is the same Pluto data set that we pulled in locally but it's also available as a RESTful API. And you can query it by lat long. And I say, give me um, all the polygons within that distance. So in this case, I grab the KPF office um, lot point. So the KPF office is here. I grab that lot. It has this information from the Pluto data set, and then I map it. And what we're seeing here is that this is saying from the KPF office, we can travel um, five minutes in this polygon. And if I wanted to change that to, let's say, how far can I get in 15 minutes as we hear about the 15 minute city, I'm just gonna rerun that. And now I can see how far we can travel in 15 minutes from that point on foot. So this is uh, something I've been seeing more and more in, in my practice, uh, as far as like a, a very quick spatial analytics. What is useful on here is if you compare, as we're thinking through, again, I think we're, we've all heard the smart city, 15 minute city or whatever, other acronym of that we've heard is it's important to think about like how far someone can get from your building, which can give you information when you query things like, let's say you query how many places are nearby using open streets to see how many nightlife is there. If I walk five minutes away, how far can I get by foot or by car? Um, it's an interesting metric that I've been seeing pop up more and more. And I wanted to uh, share it with, with everyone here um, using this method. So Again, I think this class would be a lot quicker with less questions. So we actually have some time here to open it up for any other additional questions or how to use this in production or um, yeah, happen to answer any additional questions or follow-ups as we have some time here.